Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News on India's Voice to the World. I'm Preeti Kaur, coming up in the next one hour. Judge dismisses dozens of potential jurors on the first day as Donald Trump's historic criminal hush money trial kicks off in New York. Israeli military pledges response to Iran attack amid calls for restraint. U.S. President Joe Biden reiterates Washington's commitment to Israel's defense. Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammad Shia al-Sudani calls for restraint in Middle East during talks with U.S. President Joe Biden in Washington. Campaigning intensifies for first phase of general election in India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi to address public rallies in Bihar and West Bengal. Congress to organize roadshow and rallies in Northeast India. And in football, Barcelona will take on Paris Saint-Germain in the return leg of the Champions League quarterfinals today. Borussia Dortmund will face Atletico Madrid in the second game. Donald Trump's criminal hush money trial is now underway in New York City. He is accused of paying hush money to an adult actress ahead of the 2016 presidential election. Trump is now the first former president to face a criminal trial. William Danslaw reports from outside the courthouse in Lower Manhattan. Day one of Donald Trump's criminal hush money case is in the books. Donald Trump faces 34 counts of falsifying business records. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty. Entering the courthouse, he once again railed against the justice system, saying he has been weaponized against him. He says that this case is unconstitutional, all in a bid to hurt his chances of winning re-election come November. It's a scam trial. If you read all of the legal pundits, all of the legal scholars today, there's not one that I see it said this is a case that should be brought or tried. It's a scam. It's a political witch hunt. It continues and it continues forever. There were some wins and some losses for Donald Trump and his legal team at the start of proceedings. When it comes to Donald Trump's losses, well, he was seeking for Judge Juan Machan to recuse himself from this case. Donald Trump is furious with the gag order that the judge has slapped on him. Judge Machan, though, ruling that he will not be stepping aside during this case. Another big win for prosecutors is that Karen McDougall, who claims to have had an affair with Donald Trump, will be allowed to testify. A win for Donald Trump's team, though, is that the Access Hollywood tape in which Donald Trump is heard saying that he can grab women by the genitals will not be allowed to be played, but prosecutors will be allowed to at least reference it during this trial. Jury selection is underway and it's expected to be a long and laborious process to try and find 12 people deemed to not have a strong and biased opinion of the former president, either in favour or against him. Just to give you a sense of how hard it will be to whittle down a jury pool to 12 members, well, of the initial pool of 96 people, when asked if they uh, had strong opinions of Donald Trump, more than half of them put their hands up and were dismissed from selection immediately. Jury selection is a process that's expected to last up to two weeks, and this trial as a whole could last up to two months. William Denslow in New York reporting for DD India. Israel's war cabinet met on Monday to discuss its response to Iran's attack. Prime Minister Netanyahu summoned his war cabinet for the second time in less than 24 hours over Iran's missile and drone attack. Israel, however, did not make public whether the decision had been reached. While Iran has signaled it considers the matter closed, Israeli military's chief of staff said that the attack would not go unanswered. I want to thank all our international partners who stood up to Iran's aggression. Iran's attack has created new opportunities for cooperation in the Middle East. We are closely assessing the situation. 
we remain at our highest level of readiness. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. We will choose our response accordingly. Several Western countries have strongly condemned Iran's actions but urged Israel to avoid any escalation of the conflict in the Middle East. U.S. President Joe Biden on Monday said that he did not want the conflict spreading and reiterated his demand for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Biden has hailed the unprecedented military effort to defend Israel as he hosted Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammad Shia al-Sudani at the White House. The United States is committed to Israel's security. We're committed to a ceasefire that will bring the hostages home and preventing conflict from spreading beyond what it already has. We're also committed to the security of our personnel and partners in the region, including Iraq. During the talk, the Iraqi Prime Minister called for restraint in the Middle East as tensions soar between Iran and Israel after Tehran's weekend strikes. Sudani said that Iraq encourages all the efforts to stopping the expansion of the area of conflict, especially the latest development. Uh, and we encourage all the efforts about stopping uh, the expansion of the area of conflict, especially the latest development, and we encourage all uh, for uh, uh, restraint uh, 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 and to protect the safety and security. Uh, Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammad Shia al Sudani also met with U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin at the Pentagon on Monday. The meetings come as U.S. ally Israel weighs its response to Iran's missile and drone attack, with the U.S. and Europe urging restraint. Iraq is a rare ally of both Washington and Tehran. Iraqi airspace was a main route for Iran's unprecedented drone and ballistic missile attack on Israel. Israel has remained on high alert after the attacks. However, some emergency measures have been lifted that had included a ban on some school activities and limits on large gatherings. Israel's military spokesman Daniel Hagari said that Israel sustained minor damage to infrastructure, including to the Nevatim Air Base. He said that the international coalition that aided Israel in thwarting the attack was a strategic achievement. <laughs> Thanks to unprecedented cooperation in a coalition led by United States, Britain, France and other countries, which is in itself a great strategic achievement in the Middle East, the Iranian attack was avoided and thwarted other than the infiltration here at Nevatim base. I think that considering this, the possibilities available to the State of Israel are wider and yet we need to do as the Chief of Staff said, and we will do everything that is needed in order to defend the State of Israel, and we will do it in a timing of our choosing. The Pentagon held a press briefing after Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel. Pentagon Press Secretary Major General Pat Ryder said that the U.S. was not informed by Iran in advance about its attack on Israel. Whether or not Israel responds to Iran's attack, of course, is something for Israel to, dis to discuss and to decide. Uh, as Secretary Austin has said, both publicly and privately, uh, we don't want to see escalation, but we obviously will take necessary measures to protect our forces in the region. And as was demonstrated over the weekend, we'll take necessary measures to defend Israel. United States said that Israel has moved in significant way for Gaza hostage deal, but Hamas remains the barrier. U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said on Monday that the United States is still pursuing a deal that would allow for a ceasefire lasting at least six weeks and allow more aid into Gaza. There is an incredibly significant proposal that went from the United States and Egypt and Qatar and Israel to Hamas last week. Um, and Israel moved a sig significant way in submitting that proposal. And there's a deal on the table that would achieve much of what Hamas claims it wants to achieve, and they have not taken that deal. Now, they can speak for themselves about why they haven't taken that deal, but the bottom line is they have rejected it. And if they did accept it, it would allow for 
an immediate ceasefire in Gaza of at least six weeks that would benefit the Palestinian people they claim to, um, to represent. The International Atomic Energy Agency chief said that he's concerned about possible Israeli targeting of Iranian nuclear facilities. IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi said that Iran closed its nuclear facilities on Sunday over security concerns. The inspections of the Iranian facilities will resume on Tuesday. We uh, uh, always um, call for extreme restraint. Actually, what we were discussing here, which was not about the Iran or the Middle East, is a tangible example of the need to avoid any uh, physical attack against any nuclear facility. So, but we are there, we continue, we continue our work. Let's get you updates on Russia-Ukraine conflict. Now, the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, said that the agency is very concerned about Sunday's drone attacks over the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine. We are very concerned. Um, this is why, at times, I have said at the moment, at the moment, we don't see a problem. But this is very precarious. And some were saying, well, but nothing is happening. You see what happened. We, this is a combat zone. In a combat zone, any day, something very, very serious uh, can happen. In the U.S., Republican Speaker Mike Johnson said that the U.S. House of Representatives will consider aid to Israel and Ukraine as separate bills this week. What we'll do is, is bring to the House floor independent measures. We won't be voting on the Senate supplemental in its current form, but we will vote on each of these measures separately in four different pieces. We will vote on the Israel aid, uh, on the uh, aid to Ukraine, on the aid to the Indo-Pacific, and then another measure that has our national security priorities. The FBI is opening a criminal investigation after a huge container ship lost power and crashed into a major bridge in the U.S. city of Baltimore, killing six people. The investigation is aimed at determining if the cargo boat's crew left the port aware that the vessel had systemic problems before the deadly collision, which caused the Francis Key Bridge to dramatically collapse late last month. Nearly two dozen Indian sailors are still on board. Benji Hire gets us more details. The latest from the scene of that fatal crash was that FBI agents have embarked on the Dali just upstream from where I'm standing on the edge of the shipping channel in and out of Baltimore. They are there, they say, to conduct court authorized law enforcement activity. They want to try to assess whether the crew who are still on board knew of any issues with the ship before it set sail. A 22-man crew, all but whom, all but one of whom, I should say, are Indian citizens. Uh, it should be mentioned that uh, the US Coast Guard did undertake a safety check of the vessel back in 2023. No deficiencies were found at the time. And this FBI probe is not the only ongoing investigation. The National Transportation Safety Board has one already underway to look into the cause of the disaster. There is going to be a prelim preliminary report expected in the coming weeks, but a full report might not be published for another two years. In the meantime, President Joe Biden is promising to use federal funds to build, uh, rebuild the Key Bridge, reconstruct it, a, a major crossing uh, in the US city of Baltimore. But whilst the clearing of debris takes place and whilst there are plans to rebuild, at the same time, we're hearing from many different experts who are concerned that other bridges in the same vicinity could be vulnerable if there were to be a collision of this magnitude again. Benji Hyer in Maryland, reporting for DD India. Up next, we're heading for a short break. You're watching DD India News Hour. But after the break, Australian police declare Monday stabbing at a Sydney church, a religiously motivated terrorist act. Donors pledge over $2.13 billion for war-torn Sudan at a conference in Paris on Monday. And divers in the Philippines create coral nurseries to help in propagation and recovery of damaged reefs.
as the cycle of accountability returns. The time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024. The battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The great Indian election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on DD India. Welcome back after the break. You're watching DD India News. Hour. Let's continue getting more international updates. A knife attack during a service at an Assyrian church in Sydney was a terrorist act motivated by suspected religious extremism. The Australian police said this as the incident triggered clashes outside the church between police and an angry crowd of the bishop's followers who demanded the attacker be handed over to them. At least four people were wounded in the attack, including the bishop on Monday. Police has urged people not to take law in their hands. After consideration of all the material, I declared that it was a terrorist incident. We believe there are elements that are satisfied in terms of religious uh, motivated extremism and of course the intimidation of the public through that person's acts by attending that church whilst it was being live streamed. Meanwhile, the Australian President Anthony Albanese has assured all support to the investigators. This is a disturbing incident. There is no place for violence in our community. There is no place for violent extremism. We are a peace-loving nation. This is a time to unite, not divide as a community and as a country. Police arrested a male teenager at the scene on Monday and were forced to hold him at the church for his own safety as the crowd of worshippers gathered outside. Police said there was a degree of premeditation as the male attacker travelled to the church far from his home with a knife. It was the second major stabbing attack in just three days in Australia's most populous city after six people were killed and 12 were injured in a knife attack at a beachside mall in the Bondi area on April 13th. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said on Monday that indiscriminate attacks, killing, injuries, killing, injuring and terrorizing civilians in Sudan could amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. Guterres said that the weekend attacks by RSF-affiliated militias west of El Fasha, the capital of North Darfur, and the escalating hostilities on the outskirts of the city were a fresh cause for deep alarm. Any attack on El Fasha would be devastating for civilians and could lead to a full-blown intercommunal conflict across Darfur. It would also upend aid operations in an area already on the brink of famine, since El Fasha has always been a critical UN humanitarian hub. He spelled out the point of contention, saying there are two generals that have opted for a military solution and they have until now obstructed all serious efforts of mediation. War erupted in Sudan one year ago before the Sudanese army and paramilitary rapid support forces. Donors have pledged over $2.13 billion for war-torn Sudan at a conference in Paris on Monday. French President Emmanuel Macron said during the event that the amount gathered will help meet the population's most urgent needs. Millions face severe levels of hunger as a result of a power struggle that broke out in Sudan one year ago. Our duty was to make it clear that we are not forgetting what is happening in Sudan, that we remain mobilized, that there are no double standards. This is why France, member of the Security Council and ally of Sudan with Germany and the European Union, took the initiative of this conference to show our will, our determination to put an end to this crisis from which people are suffering. India has called for decisive action on United Nations Security Council reform. Addressing the sixth round of intergovernmental negotiations on the reforms, 
India's permanent representative to the UN, Ruchira Kambod, said that the Security Council must champion an inclusive framework that truly represents the dynamic global landscape of today. She urged that the text-based negotiations must be converted into decisions within a fixed time frame. India is in favor of expansion of UN Security Council membership in both the permanent and non-permanent categories as we believe that this is the only way to achieve genuine reform of the Security Council and make it legitimate, representative, responsive and effective. In a nutshell, we need a reform Security Council that better reflects the geographical and developmental diversity of the United Nations today. A Security Council where voices of developing countries and unrepresented regions, including Africa, Latin America, and the vast majority of Asia and the Pacific, also find their due place at the horseshoe table. And for this, an expansion of the Council in both categories of mem membership is absolutely essential. India, during its G20 presidency, led efforts to tackle the global debt crisis, aided Global South in overcoming debt challenges. The country's permanent representative to the United Nations, Ruchira Kamboj, added. During our G20 presidency, India not only highlighted this issue, but also led the group in reaffirming its commitments made under the Common Framework for Debt Treatments beyond the Debt Service Suspension Initiative. We supported the implementation of this framework in a predictable, timely, orderly and coordinated manner. A pivotal outcome of these efforts was the inclusion of the African Union as a full member of the G20 at the New Delhi Summit. Through the India-UN Development Partnership Fund, we support 78 projects across 55 countries. We are committed to supporting our friends and partners in the Global South as they strive to withstand and ultimately overcome the burden of unsustainable debt. Voters in Croatia are preparing for upcoming parliamentary election on Wednesday. Polls indicate Prime Minister Andrei Plenković's conservative HDZ party will lose its majority after a wel welter of graft scandals. HDZ and the Social Democratic Party held their final rallies on Sunday. If the outcome puts a Social Democrat-led coalition into power, it could change Croatia's stance on major issues such as support for Ukraine in its conflict with Russia. The HDZ, which has dominated politics since Croatia's independence from a crumbling federal Yugoslavia in 1991, has overseen its succession to the European Union and the Eurozone and a tourism boom along its stunning Adriatic coast. Heavy rain and winds on Monday caused flooding on the roads of Manama in Bahrain. Vehicles were forced to drive through the floodwaters as lightning stoked the capital city. Heavy rainfall has caused havoc and destruction across Asia, resulting in injury and death. Swathes of northern Kazakhstan and Russia's Urals region were flooded on Monday as meltwater swelled the tributaries of the Orb River. The flooding has forced more than 125,000 people to flee their homes. Almost 1,000 houses have been flooded in North Kazakhstan and over 5,000 people have been evacuated. People in the city are facing interruption in power and water supply. At least 33 people died and 27 were injured in floods caused by heavy monsoon rains in Afghanistan. Houses in the villages of the Lalpur district saw grave damages. People were seen taking out their animals and belongings from under the mud as floods tore through crops and infrastructure in the country. Heavy rain and floods in Pakistan have caused the death of at least 36 people in the country. Disaster management officials said on Monday that many were injured and around 85 houses in the northwestern Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province were damaged by floods over the last three days. Weather forecasters have predicted more rain for the western parts of the country and the largest part of Balochistan in the following days. Filipino divers are regrowing coral reefs to help heal damaged pieces of coral in the coastal town of Buwan in the Philippines. Hoping to boost coral numbers in the face of environmental threats, scuba diving instructor Carmela Sevilla 
with a team of divers is planting coral nurseries for damaged coral across the coast. The project aims to preserve coral reefs in the face of certain environmental threats brought in by climate change, such as mass bleaching event. So far, Sevilla and her team have only collected 64 pieces of damaged coral for the nursery and plan to expand upon that number. The Philippines sits at the Coral Triangle and is home to over 600 types of corals. A quick look at other stories making it to the headlines from across the world now. A pilot and two passengers were killed after a helicopter fell in a southern Mexico City. Mexico City authorities reported that the private aircraft fell on the top of an empty car repair shop located near the UNAM University campus. Hannah Guterres, the chief weapons handler of the Western movie Rust, was sentenced to 18 months in prison on Monday. Guterres was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter for accidentally loading a live round into a revolver, which caused the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Hutchins was shot when actor Alec Baldwin was handling the gun during the film's production in 2021. In Chile, police have rescued an elderly couple lost in a snowy mountain range in the Atacama region. The couple and their dogs were rescued by authorities on their fourth day of being lost. A heavy snowstorm blocking visibility and roads left the couple in precarious circumstances. A quick break ahead, but stay with us as we decode for you the poll contest in Nagaland ahead of the first phase of polling on April 19th. Tracking the first phase of gender elections, Team Pole Pulse has reached India's northeast in Assam. This is the tea city of India, Dibrugarh. They are not getting jobs in the local area, like in Dibrugarh or nearby districts and all. Home to the finest tea, the state is set for a cracker of a contest. This is 2024. Can the Congress and allies offer a fight back or will the Modi juggernaut be unstoppable? Watch Pole Pulse on DD India. Wherever news breaks, whatever it takes. Connecting corners, cutting across continents. Stories that matter from across the globe. Accurate, authentic journalism that serves you right. From politics to glamour, from sports to world affairs, with a fusion of aesthetics and substance. Introducing news in a new avatar. Experience the world through a new lens. Stay tuned to DD India for an exciting journey beyond borders. You're watching DD India News R and I'm Preeti. A quick relook at the top stories once again. Judge dismisses dozens of potential jurors on the first day as Donald Trump's historic criminal hush money trial kicks off in New York. Israeli military pledges response to Iran attack. Amid calls for restraint, U.S. President Joe Biden reiterates Washington's commitment to Israel's defense. Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammad Shia al-Sudani calls for restraint in Middle East during talks with U.S. President Biden in Washington. Campaigning intensifies for first phase of general elections in India. Prime Minister to address public rallies in West Bengal and Bihar. Congress to organize road shows and rallies in Northeast India. In football, Barcelona will take on Paris Saint-Germain in the return leg of the Champions League quarterfinals today. Borussia Dortmund will face Atletico Madrid in the second game. And now we get to the latest on the world's largest elections in India.
Campaigning has gained momentum with high voltage political activities from all the parties ahead of India's general elections as the first phase of voting is slated for April 19th. Spearheading the campaign, Prime Minister will visit Indian's, the eastern state of West Bengal and Bihar to address public rallies on Tuesday. India's Home Minister and Senior Party Leader Amit Shah will hold public rallies in Jammu, Uttarakhand and Madhya Pradesh today. <coughs> Indian Defence Minister Rajnath Singh will hold a roadshow in Krishnagiri, Lok Sabha constituency, in, on Tuesday. Indian Transport Minister Nitin Gadkari will address a public rally in Maharashtra today. Meanwhile, the President of Congress Party, Malik Arjun Kharge, will visit Nagaland to address an election rally in Dimapur today. Congress General Secretary Priyanka Gandhi Vadra will participate in a roadshow in Tripura on Tuesday. The roadshow will be organized in support of the Indi Alliance candidates of the two Lok Sabha constituencies, Tripura West and Tripura East. Chief Minister of Punjab, Bhagwant Man, will visit Gujarat on Tuesday for a two-day campaigning. Former Chief Minister of Telangana and Bharat Rashtra Samiti Supremo K. Chandrasekhar Rao will start his election campaign with a public meeting in Sangha Reddy on Tuesday. Samajwadi Party candidate from Main Puri constituency Dimple Yadav will file nomination on Tuesday. Over 100 specially abled elderly will vote from home in Doda. On Monday, Doda's district election officer Harvinder Singh said the formal election has started in Doda and about 31 teams went to all the villages of the three assembly constituencies for voting. He added that this is a special drive of the Election Commission of India, which has brought in a very noble initiative for our absentee voters, whether they are specially abled or senior citizens, they can cast their votes from the comfort of their homes. He further said that the process gives an important message to everyone that all walks of society can take part in this great festival of democracy. DD India Siddharth Bhardwaj joins us from Masuri, a hill station in the Indian state of Uttarakhand. Siddharth, good morning. Now, the ruling government of BJP led NDA won all the Lok Sabha seats in uh, both 2014 and 2019 mega elections. How do you expect the contest to be this time around? Well, of course, a very good morning to you, Preeti, from the pictures, hills of Masuri. And, uh, you know, as you've said, that BJP always had a stronghold in this region. And this time around also, as I've had a word with locals here, that BJP still have a stronghold. This is the place where uh, BJP party president uh, 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 JP Nadda held a rally here in support of Mala Raj Lakshmi Shah, who's a BJP candidate from this region. And uh, in the rally, he talked about... Uh, uh, you know, various initiatives taken by the government, uh, various initiatives taken by, by, by PM uh, uh, Modi, uh, you know, uh, which is providing uh, uh, homes, houses uh, uh, to, uh, to people. Uh, you know, under PM Amas Yojana, he said that about four crore houses have been provided and further three crore houses will also be provided to people. He also talked about uh, uh, several initiatives like the Ujula jo Yojana, an initiative which provides a clean cooking fuel to women, especially in the rural areas. So these are some of the things which uh, 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 BJP Party President J.P. Nadda uh, said when he came here in the rally in support of uh, Mala Raj Lakshmi Shah, a BJP candidate. Also, uh, the competition is just between two parties here, Preeti. It's just just BJP and Congress mainly and like I said I've just mentioned from BJP Mala Raj Lakshmi Shah is contesting and from uh, Congress it's uh, uh, Divya Jyot uh, Gunsol who, uh, 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 a candidate who is contesting from the Congress so this is what is happening here um, in the region and also when I when I was talking to the locals here there are two pressing issues in the region uh, number one is the widening of roads because you know this is the area where everyone wants to come, especially in the summers. Uh, and traffic snarls actually troubles locals here. On one hand, it is boosting tourism in the region. And on the other hand, the traffic snarls are actually uh, troubling the local people. The second thing uh, which they mentioned to me was 
proper health care systems because in the region uh, surrounding Missouri there is no hospital or no big hospital as such so if someone is severely ill he or she has to be taken to Dehradun which is about 40 kilometers from here and like I said during peak season especially when the traffic snarls are there traffic congestion is there uh, it's very difficult for right. a patient uh, to be taken from Missouri to Dehradun all right, so infrastructure and development is on the mind of, minds of the voters, but uh, uh, let's see how the poll contest uh, further shapes up, even though uh, we've seen uh, resounding and splendid victories put forth by BJP in both 2014 and 2019 elections. Thank you so much, Siddharth, for joining in with those details. And in Tripura, electioneering is reaching a feverish pitch as leaders from various political parties are seen making last-ditch effort to woo the voters. In the first phase, Tripura West constituency will go to polls on April 19th, the state capital, Agartala, braces to witness major political showdown with the roadshow of Congress leader Priyanka Gandhi Vadra on 16th of April and mega rally of senior BJP leader and Prime Minister Narendra Modi on 17th of April, which also happens to be the last day of campaigning. For the first time, the acc accredited media personnel in Tripura will also get the benefit of casting their votes through the ballot papers. The home voting for electorate above 85 years and for Divyangs in the Tripura East parliamentary seat will be held on April 17th and 18th. All right, DD India's Kunal Shinde joins us from Agrutala in Tripura. Kunal, good morning. Uh, we've told our viewers how electioneering is at its peak in Tripura. For the two seats that go to poll, good morning. Uh, yes, uh, let us understand more from you on the political contest. Uh, how are the candidates uh, poised and also how do you gauge the political temperature in the state? Well, just two days are left for the campaigning to end. That is uh, tomorrow, uh, 17th of April. Uh, by 4 o'clock, the campaigning will end. And tomorrow, as we all know, that Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, will be there in Agartala to campaign for his party candidate, uh, Biplab Kumar Deb, who is contesting from Tripura West Parliamentary Constituency. He is pitted against uh, the India Bloc uh, nominee, uh, Mr. Ashish Shah. He is from Congress. And... Uh, uh, today, as we know, uh, Priyanka Gandhi Vadra, the Congress leader, she will be holding a road show in Agartala. And yesterday, uh, uh, Home Minister Amit Shah was also there in Tripura, where he addressed an election rally for his party nominee, uh, Kriti Devi Dev Burman, who is contesting from Tripura East Parliamentary Constituency. Uh, she is pitted against uh, Rajendra Riyang of the CPIM, that is from the India bloc. The fight is, uh, like, it is very difficult to say at this moment, like, in which way the voters will uh, voters hold their sway but uh, it will be a tough fight uh, in 2018 when the bgp came to power like they bo both the seats tripura east as well as the tripura west parliamentary seats were won by bgp for the first time in the history of tripura and this time uh, there has been change in the candidates like both the candidates uh, in both these constituencies have been changed by the bgp uh, uh, as I said earlier, Biplab Kumar Deb is contesting from Tripura West seat and yes, uh, and from Tripura East, uh, Kriti Devi Dev Burman is contesting. Yesterday when Amit Shah came here in uh, when he addressed an election rally, he spoke about the legacy of Maharaja Bir Bikram, uh, who was the king of this particular state uh, back then. And when when when. And he also he, he also criticized the CPIM, who, who, which was ruling the government, state government over here for, for more than 25 years for, for, for not addressing the issues of tribals and also not giving due importance to the king, Maharaja, uh, Bir Bikram. Uh, in, uh, in Tripura, uh, East seat, I would like to mention over here is that uh, the, the, the Tipra Motha uh, has joined like over... Oh, in, in all together over here, uh, right. BJP has uh, f forged an alliance with the Tipra Motha, which is a regional outfit, uh, yeah, headed by uh, Pradyot Kishore Dev Burman. He is the royal scion of this uh, of the uh, Dev Burman uh, of the royal royal family. All right, uh, Kunal. So political parties leaving no stone unturned to woo the voters. There, let's see how these permutations and combinations work. Uh, once the voters exercise their franchise. Thank you so much for joining in with those details.
and Mizoram police is fully geared up and the preparations are underway at their peak to ensure free and fair polling for the lone Lok Sabha seat. DGP Mizoram Anil Shukla said that 12 CAPF companies and 4,600 state police personnel have been deployed. He added that 83 flying squads and 81 static surveillance teams have also been deployed and are performing duties in various fields and checkpoints. Anil Shukla mentioned that 19 out of 1,280 polling stations are critical polling stations, which will be given extra security. Additionally, there are 138 pink polling stations where all staff will be women. In the upcoming Lok Sabha elections, Nagaland will see a fierce battle between the National Democratic Progressive Party, that is NDPP, and the Congress, focusing on long-standing issues such as the Naga political problem. Our correspondent Tapas Bhattacharya gets us more details. What do we know about the 2024 elections in Nagaland? What are the pressing issues that are making waves? Nagaland's Lok Sabha seat will witness a triangular contest as candidates of the Congress, NDPP and an independent are in the fray. Congress nominee S. Supong Moren Jamir, the NDPP candidate Dr. Chumben Muri and an independent High King Tungo Lotha are contesting from the seat. Ahead of the upcoming Naga elections, several pressing issues are looming large. The enactment of the Citizenship Act of 2019 has led to protests in Meghalaya, Mizoram and Nagaland. Ethnic strife in Manipur, which shares a border with Nagaland, remains a long-standing concern. The proposed scrapping of the free movement regime and the erection of the border fencing along the Indo-Myanmar border could have a bearing on these general elections. Despite a ceasefire in Nagaland for the past 27 years, more than half of the state remains under the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, a significant point of contention. Local and border disputes exacerbate tensions with instability in Myanmar impacting the movement and resources, directly affecting the lives of Nagas. Additionally, the Naga peace talks have encountered obstacles, particularly concerning issues surrounding a separate Naga flag and the constitution. The unique electoral practices of common platform allows key candidates to engage in participatory discussion with villagers, contrasting with the door-to-door -door campaign prevalent elsewhere in the country. With Kanapas and Naveen, this is Tapush Bhattacharya for DD India from Nagaland. In Sikkim, election campaign for the simultaneous elections for the lone Lok Sabha seat and 32 seats of the State Legislative Assembly is going on in full swing. The ruling Sikkim Kranti Kari Mocha, Opposition Party Sikkim, Sikkim Democratic Front, PJP Congress and the newly floated Citizen Action Party are making all out efforts to garner support for the electorate across the state, which will go to polls on 19th of this month. The ruling SKM organized an election rally on Sunday in Galsing. Speaking at the rally, SKM leaders highlighted the development activities taken up by SKM government under the leadership of Chief Minister Prem Singh Tamang in the last, pa in the last five years. Also, SDF President and former Chief Minister of the State, Pawan Kumar Chamling, campaigned for it, the party candidates at Gang Talk and addressed different election campaign meetings. Speaking at the meetings, Chamling announced mega employment scheme for the youth of Sikkim if the parties voted to power. <clears throat> As Gatchiroli district of Maharashtra is going for the polls in the first phase of elections on April 19th, multiple police forces were deployed in the Nagzalhut area to conduct safe and peaceful elections. 130 drones and six Mi-17 helicopters, 180 sorties will be deployed in the region. Chances of major ambush can be reduced as the helicopters can transport the EVMs directly from the polling booth to the strong room. Preparations have been underway from the past three months along with searching operations in the jungle the C-60 commander unit is also being deployed in the area. Hindustan ka dil dekho, a catchphrase of the Madhya Pradesh tourism is enough to describe the state. Due to its geogra geographical location, it is fondly called as the heart of India. India's largest tribal groups come from the state and there is a jungle book connection also with the state. Let us take a look at why Madhya Pradesh matters as India decides in 2024. Check uthega dil jo dekhe dil Hindustan ka. Located in the central India, 
Madhya Pradesh is also referred to as India's heart. The land that Rudyard Kipling was inspired by for his Jungle Book is home to magnificent mountain ranges, meandering rivers and extensive forests, including 25 sanctuaries, 10 national parks and 6 tiger reserves. It holds almost 20% of India's tiger population and houses three UNESCO World Heritage Sites, including the ancient Khajuraho temples and millennia-old Buddhist monuments at Sanchi and Paleolithic cave paintings at Bhim Betka. But similar to its cultural and scenic diversities, the state also has vibrant political character. In the year 2000, Madhya Pradesh was bifurcated into two states and Chhattisgarh was carved out of it. With an area of over 300,000 square kilometres, Madhya Pradesh is the second largest state in India and has 29 Lok Sabha or parliamentary seats. The state has a population of over 72.7 million with over a 56 million voters. This includes over 28 million males and over 27.38 million female voters. The state also has 1,237 voters from the third gender. As per the 2024 general election, schedule of the Election Commission of India, polling in Madhya Pradesh is taking place in four phases from April 19. In the 2023 state assembly elections, the voters of Madhya Pradesh gave its mandate to Bharatiya Janata Party, which is currently governing the state. It won 163, which is two-thirds of the total 230 assembly seats in the state. Campaigns by Prime Minister Narendra Modi played a significant role in the party's performance in the state elections. Though the political issues of the state are complex, the election battles are usually between the BJP and the Indian National Congress with no significant third player in the fray. Other parties like the Bahujan Samaj Party and Samajwadi Party also participate in the elections. In the general elections of 2019, the Bharatiya Janata Party won 28 seats out of 29 seats and the Congress won only one seat. As the summer sets in, central India, beginning April, the political heat is also soaring in Madhya Pradesh amid the political battle for the 29 parliamentary seats in the general elections of 2024. Sujata Lochab for DD India. Chairman of the Indian Space Research Organization, S. Somnath, attended the 42nd Inter-Agency Space Debris Coordination Committee annual meeting today. Addressing the event, he reiterated about India's clear laid out program in space exploration and utilization. We have a very clear laid out program in space exploration, space utilization in the coming days. Currently, we have 54 spacecrafts in orb, or, uh, no, orbit, plus there are non functional objects. But we have been taking very, uh, very careful action on wherever it is possible to dispose of or remove the space objects from its active role once it is over to deorbit and bring it to a safe location has been one of the important topics that we have been taking action all throughout. And we also make sure that within the systems what we launch including the upper stages of the rocket or the space routes we create mechanism by which that we will be removing all energetic possibilities within that by careful uh, design as well as implementation of uh, principles so that it will not really cause any additional debris creation. You're watching DD India News Hour. We're heading for a short break, but after the break, slump in the markets continue. Stay with us for a roundup on all the action in the world of business. As a cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects 
what makes elections 2024 the battle royale in indian politics data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why india matters the great indian election on weekdays at 8 30 pm only on tv india Welcome back after the break. You are watching DD Indian News R and I'm Preeti. Let's uh, get to updates from the world of business now. U.S. stocks closed sharply lower on Monday as a jump in Treasury yields weighed on the sentiment amid concerns about rising tensions between Iran and Israel. With the S&P 500 coming off its biggest one-day percentage drop since January 31st in the prior session, stocks opened higher in part after data showed retail sales increased by more than expected in March. Asian stocks slid as Wall Street closed lower amid ongoing concerns about U.S. inflation, suggesting the Fed may hold off on rate cuts. Rising geopolitical tensions kept risk sentiment in check, lifting prices of gold and oil. In Japan, Nikkei declined by 1.53 percent to 38,631. Topics also dropped by 1.25 percent to 2,718. And South Korea's Kospi fell by 1.6 percent to 2,627. Equity markets in India also opened on a negative note on Tuesday as Israel-Iran conflict triggered a risk of sentiment. Sensex plunged 533 points to 72,867 levels, while Nifty slipped below the 22,150 mark, falling 145 points. International crude oil prices rose on Tuesday after Israel weighed response against Iranian attack last Saturday. U.S. crude rose 0.76 percent to 86.06 dollars per barrel and Brent was at 90.72 dollars up 0.69 percent per barrel. Oil prices had ended Monday's session lower after Iran's weakened attack on Israel proved to be less damaging than anticipated, initially easing concerns of a quick intensifying conflict that could displace crude barrels. TD India's Laura Westbrook joins us from Hong Kong. Laura, good morning. Now, we've seen how the tensions between Iran and Israel led to a lackluster performance of the markets. Uh, do we expect this, uh, this performance to continue? And if so, for how long? Yes, it really has been a dour day in Asia. This comes on the back of stocks also slumping in the U.S. on Monday, as really the world waits to see how Israel will respond to Iran's air assault over the weekend. From Hong Kong to Japan to South Korea, slumped, uh, all, stock, all stock markets uh, saw a dive. Um, in Hong Kong, the Hang Seng Index slipped over 1%. In, Japan, in China, the CSI 300 also dipped as well. And that's despite some good news out of China, which saw uh, economic growth, its GDP for the first quarter, growing by 5.3%. China has said that it wants to set a target of 5% growth this year. But from Japan's Nikkei 225, uh, also slumped to t uh, around uh, 2%. It saw uh, the yen drop to its weakest level against the US dollar since 1990. And we also st saw stocks uh, fall in South Korea's Kospi, Australia's S&P, um, uh, and this follows overnight US stocks, which also closed slightly down. This is um, from the Dow Jones Industrial. It, lo it had its sixth straight losing day, as well as the S&P 500 closing down 1.2%, and the Nasdaq tumbled 1.88%. And to give you an idea of the impact of this, the geopolitical tensions that we're seeing, an index in Wall Street known as its fear gauge, it has risen to its highest level since late, late October. All right, so these factors uh, led to no sheen at the markets, but at the same time, we see that gold is glittering all the more. Uh, also, we've seen how oil prices have also risen. Uh, let us get a quick uh, word from you as to how do you gauge uh, the performance of these two in the near future as well. Yes, so analysts have said that the oil market had priced in the risk of uh, Iran's attack, which had been telegraphed days before, and the U.S. and Israel had intercepted 
most of the missiles with Israel's Iron Dome defense system. So, as you mentioned, the international oil benchmark, the Brent crude, that uh, was back above $90 a barrel. But really markets and indeed everyone else is waiting to see how Israel, Israel will respond to the attacks by Iran over the weekend and whether there is that potential for a direct conflict between Iran and Israel. Some analysts have said that oil prices could spike above $100 a barrel depending on how Israel responds to the attack. All right, Laura, thank you for joining in with those details. And after the world of business, we now turn focus to the world of sports. Talking of uh, football first, Barcelona are ready for the battle against Paris Saint-Germain in the return leg of their Champions League quarterfinal today. Barca hold a slender 3-2 advantage after the first leg in Paris last week as they bid to reach the semi-finals for just the second time in eight seasons since lifting the trophy in 2015. Barca will be without captain Sergi Roberto and Andreas Christensen, who are both suspended after receiving yellow cards in Paris. Meanwhile, Borussia Dortmund will hold Atletico Madrid in the second game on Tuesday. Dortmund are currently losing the tie 2-1 after the first leg in Madrid saw Diego Simeone's side take a 2-0 lead. Atletico are looking to secure a first Champions League semi-final spot in seven years. They controlled the first half and led 2-0 through Rodrigo Di Paul and Samuel Leno. That's it in this edition of DD in the News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, and also Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Preeti Kaur signing off. And from all of us in Delhi, thanks for watching DD India News Hour.